I wrote this a while ago, but I think it really applies. Evelyn is the rarest of visionary leaders. She's a global social scientist, a da Vinci of academic inquiry and transformative thought and collaborative activism. You will not meet a researcher or a leader who has had a similar life design. She spends a lot of time trying to explain this life design, I must admit. Her path has led her beyond the tragedy of her family's forced displacement during World War II to the highest levels of scholarship. All the while, her journey has been profoundly enriched by her capacity to form deep connections with countless individuals and communities throughout the world. Evelyn and I, we do a check-in every day. Both of us are taking care of our 90-year-old fathers, and our chief goal is to be stable and be able to do this wonderful work in the world. Evelyn is the glue that holds us together with her big love, her big heart. I'm turning it over to you, Evelyn. Thank you for being our speaker, and thank you for describing this wonderful singing we just heard. Thank you, thank you, thank you, dear Linda, dear Linda, thank you so much. Uh, just to let you know, I'm also in the background recording this and I will have to edit the recording. And uh, dearest, beloved Karin, uh, could you lovingly uh, shut off your camera? Because could you shut off your camera or Elaine, could you shut off her camera? That would be lovely. Thank you so much. Dear all. <laughs> I'm absolutely touched that you are all here. Absolutely touched. I have worked for years now on what I want to share with you in the coming minutes. And I will uh, start by uh, a little um, PowerPoint sharing. Linda, can everyone see that? Yes, they can, Evelyn. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Dear all, first, I would like to express my deep, deep gratitude to all those who have made this workshop possible. Linda, you have nurtured this workshop into life in such dignifying ways. Nobody else could do this. And I'm thinking also of our dear Morten Deutsch, who convened the first workshop in this series in 2003, and his successor, Peter Coleman, together with Daniel Kohn and their wonderful team. We are so thankful to the ICCR for hosting this workshop at Teachers College every year since 2003. I'm the webmaster of the Human DHS website. All mistakes you see there are mine, please tell me. And I have included all of you during the past weeks who have all of you who have registered for this workshop on the web page. And you see the link here at the bottom. You can download all material from this website, including all recordings, as soon as I have finalized this page. It will take me circa one month to finalize it. As I included you all in this workshop, it gave me the opportunity to learn to know all of you quite well. In the talk that I will offer to you now, I will therefore try to bring some of you in. I will start with listing some of the many questions I regularly receive. And in my answers, I hope you allow me to bring some of your contributions in. Many questions that come to me. Is there hope? What is dignity? What is humiliation? What is solidarity? Many more questions. Is solidarity only something for dreamers? What about solidarity among us against them? A solidarity that is experienced as good only by us, but as evil by them. What about charity that is humiliating, but sails under the banner of solidarity? What about the gulag, about oppression in the name of solidarity? Linda told you already about my book, it took many, many years. It's much too 
big 450 pages, four, more than 4,000 endnotes, fully referenced. It has, yeah, it's terrible, I know. Uh, part one is humiliation and humility, a timeline from 1315 to 1948. Part two, 1948 and beyond, equal dignity for all. Part three, where do we go from here? A future of solidarity. To my first question, is solidarity only something for dreamers? On page 23 of the preface of my book, I write the following and I read to you. I have met people who have depreciated my work for solidarity by saying that I must be a sentimental crybaby, too weak to face the evilness of reality, or a do-gooder who collects points for history books or heaven, or a crybully who indulges in alarmism, excessive pessimism, fanatical nihilism, or indignation entrepreneurship. All of this I'm not, I can assure you. I'm not a missionary of salvation either. I'm not a new age advocate, nor am I an Orwellian Silicon Valley techno libertarian. On page 427, I write about hope. I write that people in a lifeboat will drown if they lose time on waiting for, waiting with action until hope has befallen them. If they do that, they will, there will be no hope. Likewise, as long as we hope for miracles to happen so we can stay lazy now, there will be no hope. Hope depends on our action, on us creating hope against hope, on the optimistic fatalism of determination in the face of uncertainty. We are the authors of hope, not its recipients. Hope is the outcome of our action, not its precondition. Only if we give it our all without hesitation, this is what Linda and I do, will there be hope. And it will be slow hope rather than fast hope. Wringing our hands just slows us down from pushing up our sleeves is a well-known proverb, or as it rhymes in German, es gibt nichts Gutes außer man tut es, meaning nothing good happens unless we do it. Now, what about solidarity among us against them? A solidarity that exp is experienced as good only by us, but as evil by them. And here I want to share the story of Afghanistan veteran Drew Pham. As I said, I wish to include people connected to this workshop in my talk. And I met Drew when he worked at the Morten Deutsch Center, which is the host of this workshop. In the fall of 2016, he explained to me in the most touching detail how his solidarity widened and eventually included what he previously had regarded as his enemy. He wrote the most touching piece titled After Action in 2016, where he first explains how killing the enemy was a path for him to gain respect among his peers. Drew describes how he sat in front of the killed man and asked himself, who is this body in front of me? A haji is dead, that is enough. The books say I'm supposed to feel sick to my stomach. The books say our glands are programmed against homicide, but that is, isn't me. No one ever told me how good this would feel, firing on all cylinders, nicotine after sex. Did I shoot this man? Yes, no holes in him but mine. Drew received great praise from his superiors. He writes, the colonel enters and claps me on the back. Couldn't be prouder, says the commander. My boys are killers. 
While Drew knelt over his dead enemy's body, the mobile phone rang in his enemy's bag. Drew didn't answer it, but later the intelligence officer stopped him in the hallway. Hey man, I heard you're doing okay. I'm fine, Drew answered. Come here, said the officer. I want to show you something. We started exploiting the phone. You know, he was a cell leader. In other words, you killed a dangerous man. Congratulations. When I sat with Drew in 2016, tears came to my eyes when he explained to me in detail the harrowing inner journey that followed for him. He saw the man's friends and family on the phone, and he could not prevent that he began to feel that this man became an acquaintance, even a friend, and that he, Drew, transmuted from a proud killer to a pained murderer. I wrote a book in 2009 and the foreword was written uh, by Morten Deutsch. And the topic was basically solidarity among us against them that is experienced as good by us, but experienced as evil by them. And as, I, as you see, the, the title of the book is Emotion and Conflict, How Human Rights Can Dignify Emotion and Help Us Wage Good Conflict. And the uh, waging good conflict is a phrase that was coined by pioneer thinker Jean Becker Miller, who was our dear Linda Hartling's mentor. She developed the relational cultural theory that says that growth fostering relationships are a central human necessity. Jean would be delighted to see how Linda succeeds in nurturing growth fostering relationships in our global dignity community, including in this workshop. I'm sure, Linda, I, I think you'll agree. In my 2017 book on terror, I pointed out how violence, hatred, and terror are deeply intertwined with honor, heroism, glory, and even love. And for this book, Linda wrote the foreword. What about charity that is humiliating, but sails under the banner of solidarity? Thank you so much, dear Lyoba. You came to our 2016 Dignity Conference in Dubrovnik and you touched our hearts so much. Thank you for being with us now again. Linda, thank you for playing Lyoba's ballad, ballad of a beggar at the beginning. This ballad is about a beggar asking for a piece of bread and shelter in Rome. He was given bread in a dog's hut and passed away during the night. As in many, many other medieval stories, the beggar was in reality God, testing people's hearts. Lioba offered us this ballad because it carries a message that is universal, she said. It is a sad story about a kind of solidarity that is basically humiliating. Thank you, dear Lioba. Now, what about the Gulag, about oppression in the name of solidarity? The foreword of my book was written by peace philosopher Howard Richards, who received this year's Lifetime Commitment Award in this workshop yesterday. Congratulations, dear Howard. We admire your work so much. I will dedicate the following two minutes to honoring you by sharing some of your brilliance, dear Howard, both intellectual and ethical brilliance. On page two in the introduction to my book, I explain how the phrase solidarity can lead astray. Allow me to read from my book. I write, only in cert if certain conditions are fulfilled can the term solidarity set us on a path towards building cultural mindsets that support the well-being of all people across all difference. The first condition is that it must be global solidarity rather than local in-group solidarity for the sake of out-group enmity. And second, it must be global 
common solidarity rather than simply the solidarity among the, I quote now, uh, economist key standing among the rent rentiers, the plutocracy and globalized finance. Philosopher Howard Richards acknowledges that for some people, the wor word solidarity brings back nightmare memories of the gulag. This word, and he writes, has been the rhetoric of unworkable schemes that, that existed only on paper, while the reality has been inefficient bureaucracies, corruption, the silencing of dissent and terror. Howard Richards published three books with the phrase solidarity in the title, solidarity for full employment, solidarity to raise wages and solidarity for forgiveness of debts. Richards defends the use of the word solidarity by looking back at its history. And I quote him now again, quote begins now, the word, the word solidarity began its career as a player in the discourse of modernity as Solidarité. It was a watchword and an ideal of the French working class in the mid 19th century. The French delegation brought it into the first socialist international, the International Working Men's Association, founded in London in 1861, and through it into the world's main languages. Its main meanings were two stand together, united and mutual aid. In the early days, it was used especially to raise funds for international aid sent to comrades in distress in other countries." End of quote. Howard Richards is in favor of the term solidarity because it was historically associated, and this is so important for me, with questioning the system, both from a socialist point of view and from a pre-modern traditionalist point of view. What motivates both Howard Richards and me to use this word is that it, and now Richards' words, Howard's words, because it puts structural change on the agenda by proposing, and often these proposals are made by people who practice what they preach, like Linda and me and many others and Howard also, by proposing living by the rules of a different basic social structure than we have now. Indeed, together with Howard Richards, I am embedded in global networks of people who attempt to walk their talk, who attempt to practice what they preach. Linda and I and all of you, we practice what we preach, not just in our work, but also in our personal lives. Thank you, dear Howard. Congratulations with your award again. Now we come to the solution, finally, only these questions and problems. What do we need? We need common global glo solidarity rather than particular, particular local in-group solidarity for the sake of out-group enmity. In our registration form, we ask you the following question. What does dignity through solidarity mean to you? Sultan Somji replied that we need collective humanity, as said in Africa, Utu Ubuntu. Sultan Somji is an ethnographer from Kenya who now lives in Canada, and he has received many honors. For instance, he was recognized by the United Nations as unsung hero of dialogue among civilizations. Dear Sultan, you are with us now and yesterday and the day before. It was an absolute privilege for me to meet you in 2001, 20 years anniversary. And thank you so much for your ongoing support for our dignity work all the way since 2001. It is wonderful to have you with us in our workshop now. Several other wonderful full participants in our workshop bring the message of Ubuntu, of I am because of you. And I'm particularly thinking of Joy Ndwandwe, who spoke to us on the first day of our uh, workshop from the Kingdom of Eswatini, former Swaziland. Now, Linda. Linda has encouraged me to read from page 160 of my book to you. 
about the work of philosopher Tadeus Metz, who is a professor at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Metz invokes an Afro-communitarian conception of human dignity that develops the idea that human beings have dignity in virtue of their communal nature, in virtue of their capacity for what Metz calls identity and solidarity. He points out that sub-Saharan thought brings together two different sorts of relationships, those of identity and those of solidarity. Identity is the sharing of a way of life. It means identifying with each other and conceiving of each other as we. While solidarity is the caring for others quality of life or what English speakers would call love or friendship. Metz writes, I quote, one could identify with others, but not exhibit solidarity with them. Probably workers in relation to management in a capitalist firm. One could also exhibit solidarity with others, but not identify with them. For example, by making anonymous donations to a charity, end of quote. African thought combines those logically distinct kinds of relationship. And Metz lays out, and I quote him again, to exhibit solidarity with one another is for people to care about each other's quality of life in two senses. First, it means that they engage in mutual aid, acting in ways that are expected to benefit each other, ideally repeatedly over time. Second, caring is a matter of people's attitudes, such as emotions and motives being positively oriented towards others, say, by sympathizing with them and helping them for their sake. For people to fail to exhibit solidarity could be for them to be indifferent to each other's flourishing or to exhibit ill will in the form of hostility and cruelty. We thank you, dear Tadeus Metz, for your important work. And thank you, Linda, for encouraging me to read that. With the Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies Network, we aim precisely at realizing and manifesting solidarity on the ground. As you all know, it is a global, we are a global fellowship of like-minded academics and practitioners, a not-for-profit labor of love for a new future for humankind rather than fighting against old structures. And we have three branches, you could say, research, education, and ideas for action. And now I come to education. The World Dignity University Initiative is also a not-for-profit initiative, and it goes back to the original meaning of the Latin word universitas, scholarium, a community of scholars. The World Dignity University Initiative is an invitation to you to help form a global community of edu learners for whom dignity is central. And it is another, another founder of a field, the mother of peace education, Betty Reardon, who coined the phrase edu learner in 1988. Thank you, dear Betty, and Janet, who is here with us. Now I would like to thank David Yamada. The World Dignity University Initiative seeks to open space for all knowledge systems of this world for which dignity is central. And I wish to express particular gratitude to David Yamada for his dignifying leadership. He hosted Digni Dignilog 4 in this workshop yesterday on the World Dignity U University Initiative. Thank you so much, dear David. Back to my book. When I was 40 years old, after 20 years of global living, of being at home on almost all continents, I felt I had learned enough to embark on an ambitious plan. I wanted to outline in one single paragraph the path that would carry me until the end of my life. For three years, I reflected deeply and dialogued with many people. Try that. 
What could you bring together in one paragraph? What can carry you until the end of, the li of your life? The mission. So shall I read the paragraph to you that I came out after three years of, of thinking? We, the species Homo sapiens, face global challenges from the destruction of our ecosphere to the degradation of our sociospheres. And we must cooperate globally if we want to address these challenges. Question, what is the most significant obstacle to successful global cooperation? Answer, cycles of humiliation are the greatest obstacle. And this problem will increase the more the world interconnects, the more its finiteness will make itself palpable, and the more human rights ideals of equal dignity will become salient and create expectations that were absent before. For global cooperation in responsible solidarity to succeed, the highest goal must therefore be to dismantle existing systemic humiliation, the goal must be to end and heal present cycles of humiliation and to prevent new ones from emerging in the future. So this paragraph carries me now already two decades and will carry me further. Before I end my talk, I would like to thank Linda again. She is more than a twin sister to me. I cannot imagine how I ever could manage without her. I made a message of gratitude for you, dear Linda, that is downloadable from the top of the website, web page of this workshop. Dear Linda, I have no words to thank you for your loving and dignifying leadership. Thank you, dear Linda. Now I'm coming to the end of my talk. And even though it is not very advisable to provide overly simplified abbreviations, particularly not in times of polarization, I would like to share with you a tentative summary of my view on what I call big history. I will be reading to you pages 17 to 20 of the preface of my book. You can download it. I will take about, it will take about 10 minutes and it will require a very high degree of concentration from you to follow this very complex argument because, because it is a highly condensed summary of the message of my book. And every word, in every word, several months and weeks and years of thinking have gone. I very much hope I'm not asking too much from you by reading this summary to you now. You will find it also, as I said, on the web page. I start by summarizing the present state of affairs of our world. Then I analyze the problem. And at the end, I will come to my suggestions for solutions. Again, I, I, I'm, I hope I'm not asking too much from you by reading this summary. And I will uh, now uh, stop sharing and go and read this to you. Where do we stand? We, the species Homo sapiens, live at a historical turning point that is so important that only a long view on our history can help. We, as humankind, have dug ourselves into a multitude of perilous crises, both despite and because of what we call progress. We engage in systemic humiliation, ecocide and sociocide. We degrade our ecospheres and sociospheres at a global scale. We shred our relations with our habitat and with each other. The suffix side, like in genocide, suicide, comes from caedere in Latin and means cutting down, killing. We catalyze the degradation of our ecosphere and sociospheres by damaging our cogitosphere. And we thank our dear uh, Royal Highness Prince El Hassan bin Talal for bringing this thinking, this concept to us. And you saw him yesterday and you can download 
his explanation. The damaging of our cogitosphere, the realm of thinking and reflection, and we damage it to the point of cogitocide. As a result, we risk sliding sightlessly into collective suicide as a species, more even towards omnicide, the annihilation of all life on earth. We as humanity stand at the edge of what is called a Seneca cliff, the kind of rapid collapse that characterizes the disintegration of complex systems. If we, as humanity, wish to heal ecocide and sociocide and survive in dignity, the first step must be to overcome cogitocide, the destruction of our thinking. We need to face our calamity with an difficult word for me, equanimous mind, not with panic nor with denial. Our scientists inform us that we have a window of opportunity of around 10 years to step back from this edge and that all the knowledge to do so is basically available. Unfortunately, so far, instead of recognizing the depth of our existential crises, and grasping the historic opportunity to exit, it seems that too many of us choose to stay myopic. This is why a look at big history is helpful. It provides a wide lens that makes primary problems visible that spawn secondary, tertiary, and quaternary problems. So, Michael Britton told me I should look at you sometimes and laugh so that you don't fall asleep in between. So now comes the next part. How did we get there? How on earth could we end up here? What is known as the Neolithic Revolution merits renewed attention. It was turning a turning point in human history that was as important as the present historical moment. Furthermore, it saw humankind's primary problem emerge, namely competition for domination and control as a strategy of survival. Due to its success, at least partially, this competition remained Homo sapiens' master plan of action during the past millennia. It is a unidimensional and unilateral strategy that answers what political scientists call the security dilemma, in that it seeks negative peace by following the motto of, if you want peace, prepare for war. It was in this context that the dominator model of society arose, Rihanna Eisler, coined this concept and she sent us a message to the world also for this workshop. Thank you, dear Rihanna. In this context, this dominator model of society arose with its double intervention, namely keeping one's enemies out with weapons while holding one's own people down with routine humiliation. Until now, all systems feudalism, communism, capitalism, democracy, modernity, postmodernity, to name just a few catchwords, played out competition for domination in their practice. If only in different forms and to different degrees, and this even while promising the opposite in rhetoric. Equal dignity on the ground has been widely and systemically sold out, often even under the guise of dignity rhetoric. Our Neolithic forebears could not know better. Establishing a mindset of competition for domination was the be best they could do. They did not have the information about the world that we have today. Unfortunately, over time, even a growth dilemma superimposed itself 
and merged with the classical security dilemma. And this is where we are today. The current motto is, if you want prosperity, invest in exploitation. The situation we live in now, while it is a result of our forebears strategy of survival, becomes a strategy of collective suicide as the world interconnects and the Earth's carrying capacity becomes overstretched. Competition for domination as mindset and social and societal order has always been limited in its usefulness, but by now it fully outlives this usefulness. Even colonizing other planets would not help, given this mindset. Its resources would soon be depleted as well. This mindset drives systemic cogitocide and sociocide. It divides the global community just when it needs to come together. And by doing so, it hastens global ecocide. As it stands now, the dominator mindset drives cycles of humiliation and systemic humiliation to hitherto unseen levels. This happens in a situation where human rights ideals promise equal dignity to all, which means that feelings of humiliation no longer translate into obedient humbleness, but acquire hitherto unseen force. I call feelings of dignity humiliation the nuclear bomb of the emotions. Clashes of civilizations are therefore harmless compared with clashes of humiliation because humiliation closes doors for co cooperation that otherwise would stand open. In the absence of leaders of the caliber of say Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi and many others, cycles of dignity humiliation have the potency to turn the entire global village into a global war zone. Nothing is therefore more important than halting and preventing these cycles of humiliation. I so much hope that you are still with me. Now comes the last part. In this radically new situation, where should we go? In this situation, ideas are realistic that hitherto were deemed unrealistic. Citizen to citizen trust building at a global scale, and this is what I do, is the only life-saving strategy. Human rights ideals of global partnership and mutual solidarity offer the path to achieving lasting global dignity. The traditional role description of maleness, namely bravery in competing for domination, is now obsolete. Our planet is burning and drowning and at the same time filled with deadly arms. And this means that all men and women united are called to embrace a new kind of bravery, namely the bravery of building mutual trust, care and solidarity in global partnership. The call must be as follows. On this small and finite planet that is our common home, let us bring our forebears' adaptations to a better completion. Nothing hinders us to honor our forebears' legacy even while we unlearn their adaptations. There is no shame in accepting new learning when realities on the ground change. We possess all the not necessary knowledge and skills to succeed. Let us nurture respect for equal dignity for us all as responsible individuals free to engage in loving solidarity with each other and with our planet. Let us celebrate diversity without humiliating each other. Let us protect unity in equality in dignity. Let us turn social side and eco side into what I call socio sanity and eco sanity. Let us embrace social salvation and eco salvation. Let us humanize globalization through egalization, a word I co coined to signify equal dignity for all in freedom. Let us aim for glob egalization. More, let us do so in cooperation and solidarity. Let us work for co glob egalization. 
In this way, we can co-create a decent global village. If not, it will be a global war zone. We need the heroism of care, the heroism of dignity. We need what I call dignism as a vision for the future. Dignism as a term formed from dignity and ism. Perhaps we should not aim at, a, at another ism. Perhaps it would be better to, to live without isms. But if we need a new ism, why not dignitism, dignism? Here is my definition. I read it to you already, I think, on the first or second day. A world where every newborn finds space and is nurtured to unfold their highest and best, embedded in a social context of loving appreciation and connection. A world where the caring capacity of the planet guides the ways in which everybody's basic needs are met. A world where we are united in building trust and respecting human dignity and celebrating diversity, where we prevent unity from devolving into oppressive uniformity and keep diversity from sliding into hostile division. Thank you very much. I hope you are still with me. I hope you, are, you have survived my long, long reading. I have never in my life read so much. Thank you so much. Bravo, Evelyn. I'm joining your spotlight. Just stay right there for a moment. I'm joining your spotlight. Bravo, bravo. I want everyone to know that for Evelyn, all roads lead to love in the end. And this is another word that we can incorporate in our lives to move us on that path. I also want to point out that one of the amazing things about Evelyn and one of the reasons why I love working with her is she not only listens people into voice, she gives everyone credit she gathers those voices together and gives them credit, as you saw in this talk. So thank you for taking the time to really recognize so many people around the world contributed to your talk. And we are looking forward to having a conversation. But I want everyone to use your reaction buttons for the moment to thank Evelyn for her wonderful talk with full of ideas to consider. It's a bravo. And then I'm going to ask all of you to help me with our best present we can give her, because I know Anna Stroud is in the room. The best present we can give Evelyn is to get a picture. She would love to have a picture with all of you. So go ahead and turn on your cameras. Oh, lovely. Evelyn will love having a picture with all of you. All right, where is Beth? All right, Beth. How can we celebrate Evelyn? Can you show us this, something we can do? Should we do the heart? Oops, we have no sound for you, Beth, so. Okay, hello, is everyone here? Oh, oh Anna's um, gonna go, Beth, thank okay. you anyway. Let's Anna. do um, a round of applause for Evelyn. Keep it going until I tell you to stop, please. Okay, first screen. Second screen. Let's do a heart for Evelyn. Let's do um, the symbol of unity, however we envision that for Evelyn. And then um, any expression of joy that you want to share, and then we're done. So show us joy, however you can manifest it. We're almost done. Joy, joy, joy. And last screen. Show me your joy, second screen. <laughs> Yay, I love that, Beth. Okay, thank you for sharing yourself for the pictures. I'll see you later.
Thank you so much, Anna. And once again, Evelyn, what a wonderful talk. And I know we are going to take our joy right now into our connection reflection groups to share some more joy with your group.